My name's John Bennett. Malala is a small town in South Australia with a population of about 700 people. Malala is also where my oldest brother Tim blew himself up in a makeshift meth lab in 2010. Balaclava is a town with a population of about 2,000 people. It's about 30 kilometres away from Malala. In Balaclava, my dad teaches at the local Christian school, drives the bus and owns a small farm. He's a Pentecostal minister and used to run youth camps for uh, religious teens in the area. And that's where I saw my first ever exorcism. The town of Pinery sits between these two towns, Malala and Balaclava. It doesn't have any recorded population. Pinery is probably best known for bushfires. The town has seen multiple bushfires over the last years and three of which my dad was actually responsible for. The most famous Pinery bushfire, which was its official name, uh, of 2015 started one of the worst fires in South Australian history, destroying over 100 homes and killing two people. This is where my family live, Pinery. This is where I grew up with my mum, my dad, and my three older brothers. I left Pinery at the age of 18. Farm life wasn't for me. I wanted to get out and see the world. I moved to Melbourne. Uh, I started working in Melbourne. I didn't go home much, didn't go home, not even really for Christmases very much, couple of weddings, that sort of thing. And over the last 10 years, I've been traveling around the world, uh, performing in festivals and doing storytelling comedy for the last 10 years. This has taken me to over 51 countries and is what I am known for doing. COVID has brought me back home. Home where I grew up, in this tiny little farming community in rural South Australia with my three older brothers and my mum and my dad. My mum and dad still live there, as do two of my older brothers. My dad's a very serious man, very serious and stern man, pillar of the community, the local minister, school teacher and bus driver. The only way I can explain how serious my dad is, is when I was about six years old, one of my favorite things to do was to tell jokes. I used to like to tell knock-knock jokes, only jokes I knew as a six-year-old kid. And my dad called me over, he sat me on his knee, and he said, you need to stop doing knock-knock jokes. I said, why? He said, because they're offensive to homeless people. That's how serious this man is. So we had this very serious religious upbringing with my mum and my dad, both very religious people. My brother, Chris, my oldest brother, he loves bongs more than breathing. He loves the weed. My second brother's brother, Alf, uh, is a bit religious like mum and dad. Then you've got Tim, the third son, the black sheep of the family. And then you've got me, the youngest, the observer. This is my story. This is the milking shed. That's the barn. That's where I made uh, my parents made sleep the night that we uh, lost my virginity. She snuck into my room in the morning when they went to church and we had sex. And they caught us and she had to run away. She jumped over the fence and ran away and I found her in the bushes. On this farm when I, where I grew up from the, from the ages of zero uh, to 19, uh, my dad, uh, who, who like did everything on this farm, built this farm himself. Uh, when we were little kids, he would give us animals on this farm to teach us responsibility. And so he gave me this, this pig. We've got pigs up on the pig shed there. And he'd, 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 he'd give us pigs and uh, he'd say, this is your pig. You feed it, you give it water, you name it. It's your pet until market time. Not really understanding the effect that that might have on like a little seven year old kid's brain. So when I was seven years old, my, my pet pig, Megan, who was named after my cousin, Megan, I just like that side of the family. And, uh, and, and, and Megan, it was my pig. I fed her every day. I gave her water every day. And uh, within no time, she grew up to this big, fat pig. And then market day happened and Megan just disappeared. And I said to my dad, I said, where's Megan gone? And he said, she's gone to market. Now, I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't know what market was. I didn't know what, what that meant. I thought maybe, maybe she'd come back with some cheap scarves or something. I didn't understand what market was. 
My dad tried to explain this to me, but I still didn't get it until we were having pork chops for dinner that night in this house. And we we're having pork chops for tea and, and dad just said, held up a little bit of pork chop on his fork and said, see John, this could be Megan. This fucking blew my brain away. I couldn't believe that I could be eating my pet. I couldn't believe that I could be eating my pet, Megan, my favorite pet, my favorite pig. And so after this, my dad assesses the situation like, oh, John's, John's a bit upset. Maybe we won't give him a pig. How about we give him a dog? And so I had this dog, uh, his name was Jack. It was a Jack Russell. I was a very unimaginative kid when I named Jack. And, uh, and I loved Jack. Jack was my best, best friend. And, and uh, I knew Jack was my best friend because when I started going to school, I would get off the school bus and walk down a long winding driveway to the house and Jack would spot me from the house. And run all the way down the long winding driveway to the bus stop and run around my legs and run all the way back to the house and all the way down the driveway and around my legs and all the way back to the house and all the way down the driveway and around my legs and he'd lie on his back and piss all over himself. Now that's friendship. But also when I was about eight years old, Jack died. And again, my dad, he said, this is just farm life. Animals die. And so I was distraught by this. I'd lost my best friend. I, I'd, I'd, I'd lost Megan, my pig. And again, dad, he didn't, didn't want me to miss out the youngest son of four boys. So he gave me another animal. He gave me a calf, this little tiny calf that I fed every day. I gave it water every day. And it's completely true. I named this calf uh, Auntie Verna after Megan's mum. I just must, I like that side of the family, I guess. And, uh, and I had a duck called Duck Duck that wasn't a member of that family, but uh, had this little calf and I would come to this milking shed every day and I would, I would feed the calf. I would feed Auntie Verna. And just like Megan, within no time, she grew up into a big fat cow. Now, when you're up on the farm in rural South Australia, where we are right now in the middle of nowhere, all you do on weekends is play sports. And me and my brother Tim are getting ready for the under 10s football on a Saturday morning. And we're kicking the football right in this area here, just kicking the football to each other before the under 10s football. And Tim kicks the football over the milking shed where we milk the cows, obviously, why we name the shed that. And Tim kicked the football over the milking shed and I ran around the back of the milking shed to go and get the football. And as I was, as I was running, I stepped on this patch of dirt. And when I stepped on this, this patch of dirt, I, I sprung up into the air. And I turned around and I checked the patch of dirt and it was a springy patch of dirt. Now, I'm from a poor family. This is a tiny little farm out in the middle of nowhere. We didn't have trampolines or anything like that growing up. So a springy patch of dirt, that was fucking exciting to me. And so I started jumping on this springy patch of dirt. And I'd like to say I was doing awesome backflips and stuff. It was about a foot off the ground, but still that's amazing for a springy patch of dirt. And I'm jumping on this thing and I yell out to Tim from over the milking shed. I go, Tim, Tim, I found a dirt trampoline. I found a dirt trampoline, Tim. Tim comes running over and sees me he's jumping on this thing and, and as, he, as he does I go to do this sort of, this sort of show off type move, this sort of flourish type kick thing. It's, it's a little bit effeminate now but this, this sort of kick type thing and, and uh, for those of you who had trampolines as kids, you know the number one rule is you shouldn't wear shoes on them. You should definitely not wear football boots on them. And I'm all decked out in my under 10s football gear. I go to do the show off jump and the stud from my football boot pierces the fabric of the dirt trampoline. And this popping sound happens. And I fall into this hole and this hole starts filling with this gray, thick fluid and this smell fills my nostrils as I sink deeper down into this weird bog. It's up past my knees. I look up at Tim who's watching the whole thing and just go, what's happening, Tim? And he just runs away, leaving me in this hole and I, and I cry out for help. My dad hears my cries. He comes walking around the back of the milking shed, sees me in the hole, picks me up out of the hole, carries it to the front lawn, puts me on the front lawn and gets the hose and starts washing off my legs. And as he's doing this, I'm crying and I say, what was that, dad? What was that? And it's then that dad told me that two days earlier, Auntie Verna, my pet cow, had died and that he had buried her out the back of the milking shed. And then he just 
nonchalantly describes to me that when animals die, they become fat and bloated and full of gas and fluids. And I, I realize I've been knee deep in Aniverna. And I cry some more. And again, my dad, the serious man, doesn't really realize the effect that this is having on his little eight-year-old kid's brain. He just pricks me up, puts me on the back of the truck, when we lie right in the cab with the rest of the family, and we go to the under 10s football. And you know, some people have said it was the smell. Or the fact that I had half a dead cow on my legs. That morning, I was untouchable in the under tens. I take a walk like this with my dog as long as I'm not in a national park. Sometimes the frost hasn't thawed, the wind is freezing or we're shrouded in mist and very occasionally it snows. And sometimes the path is brown to dust, there are searing winds turning the air a hot choking pink. When the bushfires come it's bloody scary and none of us is out walking. We're on high alert as fire trucks scream up our streets and choppers circle. We're hosing down our houses and our dried out gardens and ready to jump in our cars with boots already packed and get out in seconds flat. We live on the edge here, literally on a plateau. Valleys drop into rugged bushland either side. I'm part of the latest wave of European invaders. The first came in 1813, some 25 years from first arrival in 11 ships loaded with the unwanted, a cargo of convicts. Expeditions to cross the Great Dividing Range by hacking their way through rugged valleys were defeated again and again until the intrepid Brits learned to follow the ridges as the local Dareg and Gandangara peoples had done since time immemorial. This latest wave, of which I am a part, has come here for its spectacular beauty, its clean air and its relative affordability. We are both the displacers and the displaced. Refugees from the city, baby boomers, many of us artists, academics, vociferous protesters still smugly believing in our ability to change the world for the better. The old lefty brigade is often denigrated by locals more in favour of development than preservation as being entitled pensioners who are turning the region into God's waiting room. And we will, in all probability, die here. But we do try to find our balance, hoping it's not too late to reverse the destruction, because living here, you just can't ignore it. 230 years of Europeans over clearing, over farming and over mining, as opposed to 60,000 years for the first inhabitants, who despite the odds are still living here and still willing to share their knowledge of country, if we just sit and listen. In this year's horrific bushfires, flames roared up from this valley from a fire which burned for almost seven weeks. A fire season of unprecedented ferocity and duration followed by an unprecedented pandemic. When lockdown hit, she got a shock. Well, of course we all did in the face of an invisible enemy, so different from the clear and obvious danger of the bushfires. But it was the warnings to the older people she found affronting. She felt displaced from her community, even her sense of home, as if she'd suddenly been propelled forward in time to how she might be in her 80s very different from her currently active 70-year-old self. Never mind she had no underlying health conditions and was fitter than many 20 years younger. Stay home, see no one. 
let others do your shopping for you or pick up your prescriptions. Though she wasn't on any medication, she didn't need help. In fact, she was still up for helping others, delivering food to the sick, walking dogs for those who were less mobile, dropping off birthday gifts to the bereft or left at a safe distance. But she wasn't quite sure if these would be classed as essential reasons for leaving home. So she kept the esky bag of empty food containers on the passenger seat, just in case she was stopped by the cops. She imagines if this continues that anyone in her age group will be targeted, both openly and by more underhand means. Any changes in complexion appearing flushed or grey or clammy or God forbid, coughing audibly, and anyone could dob you in. Had she been reading far too much dystopian fiction? It was during lockdown that her fear of a very specific kind of death resurfaced. Que mangia solo, crepa solo. An Italian proverb that had struck a chill through her years before. He who eats alone, dies alone, or she. That resonance now magnified, striking a small note of terror. Until now, she told herself that the single life was hers by choice, and on balance, it had more advantages than not. She was gregarious and a pretty good cook, and the choice was hers to eat alone, what she wanted and when, or to invite friends over for a meal or to go to theirs. She really loved the easy exchange of hospitality in the mountains, the way her guests would arrive swathed in coats and scarves and hats and gloves and smiling as they peeled off all the layers and gathered round the fire. So different from her harried guests in the city arriving late and grumpy and complaining they couldn't find a park. But for now, all this is on hold. Of course, she knew she was well off compared to others and she was enormously grateful for her health and not to be homeschooling or suddenly cut off from a beloved parent in aged care. She worried about family interstate and friends overseas, but she could still eat what she wanted, choose her own binge series, go to bed or get up just as she pleased, uninterrupted with a partner's struggles, with anxiety or their nightmares or snoring, finding the gentle rhythmic snores of her aging dog quite comforting. But the dog, her beloved dog, was the key to the grisly image that so intensified under lockdown. With work cancelled, theatres closed, no lovely little art house cinema up the road, no exercise class, no book group, no cafes, and the walks with her dog along the local tracks, now solitary affairs. And if you met others with their dogs, you resisted patting them. Well, how long would the virus stay on a dog's head was, is still an unknown among the sea of other unknowns and she can't get methylated spirits anywhere to wipe down, oh, not the dog, but the surfaces. Even though no one but you is allowed in your house, there are the packets from the supermarket. Should she have everything delivered, contactless? They wouldn't even know she was there, would they? Ringing the doorbell and scurrying away as if from the house of the neighbourhood witch. Who would know, at least for a few days, maybe a week, that this was the day her crazy fear had eventuated, that she had fallen, had been felled, and was at this moment lying dead on the floor, dead but not absolutely intact. After all, dogs are known to, aren't they? Even the most gentle pet can, out of anxiety, start to lick the dead biped's face. And then when there is no response, they go further. And When did this image become so indelibly planted that she cannot unimagine it, can only dance around it, joke about it? And the awful thing is it has happened twice to people who live or lived near her, one of whom she knew slightly had chatted with just the week before, no names, no pack drill, but two cases, both a bit younger than her, living alone with their dogs. So how had it come to this? She'd predicted the trajectory of her life very early. She was 16, on school holidays, 
and helping her mother out on her volunteer day at the kiosk at a nearby hospital. No kiosks these days, a couple of vending machines and bugger the need for human contact or freshly made sandwiches and a hot cuppa. The other volleys in their flowery aprons had asked her about boyfriends and getting married, still the era in which uni and a career were considered stepping stones. Ah, oh, I'm not going to get married. I'm just going to have affairs. She'd risked offending them, but they'd all laughed, even her mum, and they'd all carried on about what it'd be like to take a lover or even a string of them. They were joking, but she had really meant it. And so she had loved and lost and loved and lost and sometimes loved and fled when the loving became impossible. But finally, she came to value her solitary life and to be actually living here with such glorious panoramas. And there was nothing she found, no problem or personal slight or dilemma of any size that could not be resolved on a morning walk along the countless tracks she kept discovering. Although it could be on a bush track that she simply missed her footing on a tree root or skidded on loose rocks or misjudged the edge. Perhaps the choppers would come looking. When they start to circle up here, we all know someone is in trouble. Have you heard who they're looking for? We ask. And it's not just the thrill seekers who fall, the Instagram generation, anxious for the most daring shot swinging out over a canyon, scaling the rock face just a little bit too fast. No, it's experienced bushies as well, the ones who know those rocks like the back of their hand. Or the older woman who'd walked the same tracks near her home for years until the day she became disoriented, the GPS on her phone didn't work, and she was never found. It's the afternoon, two days before Christmas, and I join all my neighbours out on the street as the helicopters circle for hours over the fire and even though it gets to just 300 metres away, the volunteer fire crew on our corner reassure us, nah, it's fine, we've got this, and they do. But if the wind comes up again, well, we have to be ready for embers one of my neighbours tells me about beating out the ember fires on his front lawn in 2002. He tells me not to worry. They'll fight to the last blade of dried out grass on my place, if needs be. By March, the rain had fallen and finally the fires were out. But this neighbour chose to isolate at his place in the city and none of us gathered in the street or anywhere else for that matter. Isolation did get easier. After those first stunned weeks, she hooked up to Zoom for book group and hard fought trivia quizzes and Italian conversation and family birthdays where they all sang across closed state borders and watched presents being opened by little ones. Their mouths watered at pavlovas filled with cream and passion fruit and raspberries from those far flung gardens. But oh, she missed the hugs. But before she knew it, she could welcome friends back to her own table, in cautious ones or twos at first, passing the hand sanitizer along with the pepper and salt. And as for her ridiculous fear, she decided that's all it was, ridiculous and self-indulgent. She won't know what happens after she's dead, just some kind of posthumous vanity, really, although she'd like to spare whoever finds her the awful shock. Death will consume her one way or another. Having her bones gnawed clean or her flesh rotting into compost on the forest floor, all part of a natural cycle, like all those poor burnt out trees with new growth already sprouting from their trunks and roots. But as a concession to her fear, she bought a new smart ass watch. It urges her to complete her daily exercise goals, and if she falls with enough of an impact, it sounds an alarm. No answer within five seconds, and the watch dials triple zero. Well, I never. Some small measure to help her keep a balance between risk-taking and caution, allowing her to walk, to explore, to learn to connect, to find her place. 
just sitting and listening would be a good start. A few years ago, I went to an Aboriginal women's business retreat with women coming here from all over to share stories and pain and healing. A gently spoken woman sat next to me at a tea break, told me how delighted she was to be back on Darug country after many decades up the North Coast. She'd been forcibly removed from her family here as a six-year-old, adopted by a white church-going couple whose kindest term for her was little black bastard. There was such anger and pain in that memory, but she smiled again when she said how thrilled she was to be back and to be able to bring her adult daughter onto country for the very first time. Both of us were in tears. We could only sit and hug each other, the displaced and the displacer. It's early June and restrictions have finally eased and there are no more stay-at-home orders for us here in Victoria. So I'm getting ready to go out. <laughs> I've almost forgotten what it's like to be outside. Oh, to sit in crowded spaces and to talk to people face to face and to spar with words hotter than the aroma of spices coming out of Hannah's Moroccan soup bar kitchen. <laughs> I miss Hannah and I miss the soup bar. <laughs> I miss talking with my friends about saving the world <laughs> while binging on crispy fried zucchinis. Yeah. Oh, don't judge me. There's absolutely nothing wrong with agitating for change while binging on crispy fried zucchinis. Let me put it to you this way. Quirky as it is, the Moroccan soup bar has proven itself to be no ordinary restaurant. No, it's a community. It's a place of transition and transformation. It's where important conversations take place and awareness is raised about issues like indigenous rights, women's rights, uh, Islamophobia, homophobia, uh, the climate change and all these other important pressing issues and all of this happens within this really warm environment of communal dining and a welcoming staff of mostly hijab wearing women who serve you delicious social justice platters with a side of hummus. <laughs> That's Melbourne for you, right? And for me, this is the heart of my Melbourne. And you know these women that Hannah hires? She hires them regardless of their training and their expertise, allowing them the opportunity to make their way toward independence and autonomy with dignity. Now, come on. Tell me that binging on crispy fried zucchinis didn't get just a little bit tastier. <laughs> so, yalla, I am stepping outside my apartment door. I am walking down the corridor into the elevator and toward freedom. Yes! But I'm, I'm not sure what to expect out there. See, life has been on hold for so many months now. And Hannah actually shut down Morocco soup bar two weeks before everybody else was ordered to shut down. Yeah, she wanted to put the health of her community and her workers ahead of her profit margins. She told me, she said, Samah, if any of these women who work for me, who are the most disadvantaged members of our society, if any of them turned up at the hospital and the hospital had to make a decision like they did in Italy between who lives and who dies, you reckon they're going to be looked after? I'm not naive, she said. Of course not. Yeah, so she shut down. And, and what happened since is that while most of her staff were able to get on some form of government, Assistance. A few of the women fell through the cracks. 
And so when I asked Hannah what she planned to do, she just said, look, I told them, whatever happens, we will endure it together. Well, Lavi, she said to me, I don't know what I will do, but I know I need to look after them. And I know she did. Yeah, she looked. It has taken me less than 20 minutes to drive from Dockland to St. George's Road in North Fitzroy. It's really strange. Usually this drive takes at least half an hour, but there was just absolutely no traffic along the way. Melbourne's CBD streets were almost empty. Carlton too. There were no crowds of all walks of life congregating outside Lyman Street, washing down their French pastries with barista cups of coffees and endless chatter. There was hardly anyone outside. Nothing. Hardly anyone. I'm parking my car in Fitzroy and the impact of the closures here is overwhelming. Lots of shops have for lease signs on them. Few are vacant, almost all of them are still shut. Oof. Fitzroy has been dealt a terrible blow. I'm standing outside the doors of the Moroccan soup bar and it too is shut. So I text Hannah, she tells me she's on her way from her other location just road. Hmm. So I wait. And as I wait for her, I remember. I remember how every night before six o'clock, people would start to line up outside this door right here where I'm standing. There'd be young men with woolly beards and women in colorful cardigans or really elegant dresses. There'd be dreadlocks and perfectly straightened hair, there'd be high heels and runners, hijabs and crosses conversing. It didn't matter. The nightly queue for a table in all its diverse glory would go all the way to the end of the block and around the corner. As I look around me right now, I see no one. Where did all the hipsters go? Hmm? <laughs> well, you know, Fitzroy is the hipster capital of Melbourne, right? Where are they? Fitzroy. Did you know that it was actually the Europeans who called this area Fitzroy? Yeah, its real name, its cool name is Ngarago. Yeah, I learned this right here when I shared a table once with um, a beautiful Aboriginal sister. Yeah, she, she said to me that a hundred years ago, Ngarago was the heart of Aboriginal Victoria, that this is where civil rights activists fought to reclaim generations stolen by white hands. These are the conversations that I really miss having. Oh, I can see Hannah. She is crossing the road. She's running towards me and she stops 1.5 meters away. <laughs> oh, it's so good to see you, Hannah. But this whole social distancing thing is doing my head in. <laughs> so Hannah unlocks the door and we step into the soup bar and that's when it hits me. <laughs> I begin to understand what is going on. Oh, oh no, Hannah. Oh, no. This place isn't going to open its doors again, is it? No, she says. Huh. Right there, right there is the most ugh, striking moment ever. 
I mean, Hannah, who is never lost for words. And I mean, ever. Hannah is just standing there in silence, like you would at a funeral. Her eyes are tenderly embracing the walls and the objects of this iconic place, gasping for its last breath. I met Hannah here, you know. Yeah, right here in that corner over there next to the kitchen door. We didn't make a good first impression on each other. <laughs> it was definitely not love at first sight. Uh, she told me she thought I was a snob. And I told her what I thought of her. I told her that when I first saw her, I was really intimidated by her. <laughs> like, wouldn't anyone be? She just just came straight at me and she looked straight into my eyes and she spoke with so much conviction that she triggered this automatic fortress wall to rise in me. And in my own defense, I would like to say that I too am a warrior spirit. I come from Palestine. So I wanted to protect myself and my shields went straight up. But yeah, we met here and, uh, and Hannah introduced me to her spoken menu made up of unculturally appropriated, socially responsible hummus dips and shatara and falafels. <laughs> you know, seriously? What more could a Palestinian, Australian, Muslim, feminist, progressive, lefty, refugee, immigrant, artist, activist, woman of color like me ever ask for, right? Oh, and it was, it was right here. It was right here inside these walls that our friendship grew in a cradle made of bricks and steel, painted with vibrant colors, and decorated with beautiful lanterns and blue Moroccan. So sorry, Habiti. I'm so sorry that you have to let go of this place. It is only a building, Habib. <laughs> she says to me in her ever so positive voice. <sighs> oh, she picks up a poster of a woman wearing a Saudi headgear with the Arabic caption, I am my own guardian. I am my own guardian. The Moroccan soup bar walls have embraced dozens of feminist posters over the years. And now Hannah's gathering them all like so tenderly, like they're her children. And she's stacking them up on top of each other, ready to move them with her to her new location, just down the road. can't believe that the landlord refused to help her. I mean, she was in this space for what, 23 years? And he just refused to cut her any slack. And now her only option is to pack her things and move? God. Ugh. Hannah's taking one last lot. look and she's signaling me that it's time to go. And I'm imagining a younger Hannah, all curly hair, piercing eyes and convictions, <laughs> driving down St. George's Road in 1998 when, boom, destiny greets her. <sighs> when she stood outside this old building all those years ago and she gazed through its shop windows, what did her eyes see? A vacant place? abandoned, full of dust, not that different really to how it looks right now as she packs the last of her spices, posters, rugs and lanterns and walks away forever. 
my mind, my mind shifts back to the indigenous peoples of this land. They understood that the earth cannot be owned, that no amount of concrete and steel can nourish our souls and our spirit. This place, this place is, is only given meaning by the stories that it holds. And there will be other stories in another place. You're right, Hannah. You're absolutely right, Habiti. It's only a building. As we walk away, I can see Hannah's eyes have already began to chart an exciting new path. Her mind is already filled with positive ideas and larger than life adventures in a new location. And I know she will invite us once more to walk along her path with her and help her change the world to the better while binging on crispy fried zucchinis somewhere else perhaps in Ngargo. This town clings to the false thought that nothing has happened. One could be forgiven for thinking it. Ah, it's just a heap of fuss over a bit of a flu, mate. Come, Wolford. But come to where I am, in the far north, in the deep north, butt up against the brink of wilderness nowhere, more kindly understood as the last slice of Gondwana pie. And you will find us oddly quiet. So, the brochure says, this town's got the oldest continuous rainforest in the world and one of the seven natural wonders of the world right in our shop front. These magnificent smack you in the gob, unknowable, uncountable, immeasurable paradise jewels, reef and rainforest. We trade in precious things here. Our business is brisk. Cairns has been brisk for 20, 30 years. Turnover, 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 tumbling, streaming from all over the world, a rapid running river rushing in and out, gasping, ooh, oh, the thunderous, calamitous motion, eddies of consumption, great rolling waves, a foaming fury of recreation and wonder. Yes. We're all lining up to see the oldest continuous rainforest in the world and one of the seven natural wonders of the world before they both disappear for good. The cacophony of us here on the brink. Unstoppable. Until just now. We must sit. Just sit. Listen. Nothing. No touchdown, no takeoff, no comings, nor goings, no air brakes, no joy fly, choppers, no bus pickups, no clicky clack on the tracks, no trundling wheels of suitcase rattle, no manifest, no head counts, no grind, no grumble, no gander, no gaggle. Gone. Shuttered shops, unmolested, racks and stacks of tour brochures, no specials of the day. No swish nor splash at the artificial lagoon that now is calm as a beached whale against the sticky mudflats of the foreshore. This empty tourist trap, these empty car parks, empty beds, thousands of them, their crisp cold sheets strapped tight in dim, breathless hotel rooms. Day boats tethered at their mooring along silent finger wharves, bobbing, nodding, dumbly, agreeing this is all very strange yes 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 the whole tourist down town is shut down 
we are becalmed in COVID waters. This quiet, this disquiet, dis, a Latin prefix meaning apart, asunder, away, utterly, having a negative or reversing force. Yes, a reversing force. This disquiet is a reversing force against the quiet. You see, the flu never really got a stronghold here, not really, which is a flaming miracle given that we are an international tourism destination and a literal nexus of cross-germination. There is no lockdown, there are no masks, there is no panic as such, not yet. We're shut pretty much because the rest of the bloody world is shut. I don't actually work, isn't it? work in tourism. <laughs> no, but because the whole town functions on tourism, I actually do work in tourism, don't I? A tiny trickle of tourists tickles us from the southern state punters that set up such a flurry for a tick until the second wave hits in the southern states and borders clap shut. That's the end of that thin hope then, isn't it? Fuck it. And so we are waiting in the troubling quiet, simmering. I live some distance from town, but up against that rainforest I just mentioned. Yet close enough to know the town, muffled and miserable, was right there over the hill. I was at home that day, well, most days actually. I was home when I realised this. Flea Boy and Budster, they seem oddly put out that I'm at home and not away, as if being home, I'm intruding on their personal space, their doggy downtime. Or is that disquiet in their eyes meaning something else? I often catch them, staring off into space, staring off into the forest, like something is amiss. And then I realise, the dogs hear things I cannot, and they're confused to suddenly not hear what they were born hearing. The vibration of us, of tourism itself, the planes, cars, trains, trucks, buses, silent. Then I realise they're hearing things in the deep forest they have not been able to hear before. Intense, small, scuffling, sliding, slithering, flapping, rustling, padding, puff, puff, puff. Ooh. What was that? their astonished faces say. Then I realise, yes, of course, there are no muttering, pattering day boat motors flogging their propellers into the sea every morning to rummage through the reef and flog back to the decks, docks every arvo to disgorge their sunburnt cargo. No container ships slugging through the reef corridors, no mega cruisers, power thumping through the water to park their backsides on the wharves and meaninglessly roar their throaty horns, all that powers all those tours, the rumble of us, is silent. Anthropo anthropogenic noise. You're right, I had to Google it. Anthropogenic noise, the noise that we make as we go about our business, has been dialed down to mute. And with that, Paradise Gondwana can finally hear herself think. Thank God for that, she says quietly. Oh, the conversation she is having since we shut the fuck up. Trees talk to each other through their vibration, through their roots, through fungi in the soil. Dolphins signal each other. Whales sing amorous ballads. Sharks hear their heart's desire calling through the deep long blue all creatures now celebrating well out of my earshot. Paradise has discovered a reversing force, coming in loud and clear in notes too high and too low for us to know. Something has happened. Something has happened. Yes, yes, yes. Six months into this, we are, and the town struggles to give the impression that we are normal again. Traffic on the road, shops, cafes, restaurants open, general business limps along on local trade, toilet 
rolls are once more stacked in neat clean towers in the supermarket all as well but not a single bloody tourist nor will there be for at least a year or more and even then hundreds of businesses are bailed up but up on the brink thousands and thousands of jobs doing a slow motion silent free fall over the edge into uncertainty, into the wilderness, nowhere. Who are we exactly without tourists? A country town, uneventful, isolated, unsophisticated, sweaty and indignant. The whole town roils with this silent catastrophe out of our hands, it tumbles over and over and over. See now, says Paradise in that soft, cooing breeze of a voice that I suppose she has, imperceptible to the human ear that it is. This is how it feels, to suffer the impact of a thing unseen, to witness your own undoing by forces out of your control, little by little, blow by blow, reversing over the brink. See now you know. See, now you know this disquiet in my town and personally I am clinging to a new thought that when the snapback miracle comes, if it will come, it will snap us back into a different place. That we will use this opportunity as a town, as a country, as a planet that's getting smaller and smaller and gr more grey by the noise of us. We will use the opportunity to reverse the rapid running river of us, or at least slow down. Will we? Will we? Acknowledge something has happened. <laughs>